talk about end-to-end -end solution and the way the current trends in the biomanufacturing industry is going to impact uh, our activities. So let's start with the trends. Uh, as uh, Jerry said, and as you said as well, there is a, a, a deep uh, trend, uh, a deep pressure on the cost of goods uh, currently, mostly driven by the biosimilar drug development, but not only, the payer pressure is huge as well, and we have to decrease the cost of goods if we want to address all of the patients that we can address with our new drugs. And this cost pressure, as we will see in the presentation, is mostly addressed at, at the process development step of uh, drug development. There is another uh, trend, and I got this information from the BPOG, you know, this large organization where uh, most of the people from the industry work together in order to predict and to forecast the needs uh, for our industry in the future. So uncertainty is one of the key trends in our industry. Who knows if a product uh, will be successful after phase three, if it will get market approval. Uh, given the competition, you know, most of the drug makers, they don't have the same monoclonal antibody to target a protein, but most of them, they target the same protein, which means that there is a huge competition, not only for MAPS, but for CAR T technologies and for many other approaches. So the uncertainty is definitely one of the key trends. Market growth, and that's the good news of uh, today, market growth in a, is, is sorry, uh, another trend thanks to emerging markets, okay, in Brazil, in uh, Russia, in China, in India, in South Africa, perhaps in Turkey, in the future, we will see. Uh, uh, people need drugs, okay, they have food, they have their house, they have safety, security, they have everything they need, and now they need drugs uh, to cure their diseases. Uh, which, this is something that impacts uh, the way we do manufacture uh, our drugs. You know, when Sanofi was successful in the 30, uh, 30 years ago, uh, they were successful because they decided to go to North America, which was very innovative for a French company. But today it's completely different, and people want to address the global market. And the way they address the global market is that they set up facilities uh, for regional production, which means that uh, they, they have smaller facilities. Of, it's not related to what you presented before, but for Amgen, for example, it's the case, uh, regional facilities, multi-product facilities, where they can uh, provide their drugs uh, in the, for the, their regional markets. One manufacturing facility for Europe, one other for North America, one other for Asia, and they have to take transfer their process, and we will see that this is something that is difficult to manage. The last trend, but I will not focus on this one today, is new product classes, and there is a change on the other side of the Charles River, people are developing small interfering RNAs, messenger RNAs, cell therapies, gene therapies, and sometimes they put them together in order to address unmet medical needs. And that's a deep trend, of course, in our industry, but given that the market is mostly made by 60 to 80 percent by monoclonal antibodies, I will focus on monoclonal antibodies today. So what if we consider the cost pressure and the market growth. Most of the time, they don't go together. If there is a market growth, there is no cost pressure. Nobody wants the, the price to decrease. But there is the biosimilar drug development. It was supposed to be a revolution 10 years ago. Uh, people considered that this patent cliff was going to deeply impact our industry. It did not. Actually, biosimilars today are two to five percent of the market. It did not impact our industry as much as it was expected or predicted. But, so it's not a revolution, but it's a slow evolution and it deeply changed the way people are going to develop and distribute their drugs. Uh, people really consider costs today, which was not the case before. Because, because once the drug is off patent, uh, the competitive landscape is completely different. The people in front of you, they have the same product. So what do you have for the competition? You have your reputation, you're called Amgen or Biogen, that's nice. Uh, you have your experience, the same, and you have your price. And if people in front of you decrease their price by twice, 
you have to decrease your price as well. If you can't decrease your cost of goods, you will not preserve your margins and you may go to bankruptcy, which is not something that we hope, of course. So it's a, small, uh, a slow change, but it's a deep wave and it's going to, I think, it's going to impact our industry in the long term. How is it going to impact our industry? Mostly in decreasing the cost of goods thanks to process developments. So you know that process development for monoclonal antibodies is something that is very uh, long and difficult to manage. It takes time from DNA to clinical manufacturing. You have to develop a cell line. You have to put your cell line into a bank. You have to develop your upstream process, your downstream process, and you have to develop your analytics in parallel. It takes up to 12 months. And we know that today, this change, this trend in our biomanufacturing industry deeply impacts the, process, the way we develop processes. So, but the pressure is not on the process development itself, on the cost of process development. It's on the way process development can decrease the cost of goods once the drug is on the market. And that's the way we work, and how can we de decrease the cost of goods once the drug is on the market? Thanks to an improvement of the yields, thanks to an improvement of the title. So this is one example of what we got when we developed a process for a customer. Uh, as you can see, we, we went to a 6.5 uh, grams per liter a titer, which is good, and which is enough to go for clinical manufacturing. And this is important, but the key is to develop analytics in the same time as you develop your process. Otherwise, uh, you will uh, waste your time. What if you get a very nice titer, but your drug is not potent? That's a waste of time. That's a waste of money. So what we do is that we develop the process and we develop analytics in the same time. And we have experienced people, as you can see on this movie, who can do that in a facility in France where we have the experience of developing processes for more than 200 uh, different proteins in the past. It was acquired by our, uh, by our, our company and uh, for the last six years we work uh, with those people in order to improve the process development of our customers so that uh, we become the preferred provider in the near future. So as you can see on this movie, uh, uh, we develop analytics in the same time as the process. We have a QC lab next to the process development lab so that people can work together and we don't waste our time uh, with developing the process first and the analytics uh, at the end. So having a nice process at the lab scale is, is cool, is nice. But being able to take transfer this process and having a robust process for sustainable manufacturing is key. And that's one example of what we got, and I will discuss about the way we take transfer processes from one bioreactor to another at the end of this presentation. But as you can see, at 3 liter scale, at 200 liter scale, at 2,000 liter scale, the titer is the same. And that's exactly what is expected when we have to manufacture a new drug. Another example, to decrease the cost of goods. Uh, this is one step, one chromatography step, where we decided to deeply change the way we purify our protein so that we don't bind and elute the protein on the column, uh, but we overload the protein on the column in one step so that we retain everything that is not required and we can uh, harvest uh, at, at, uh, at the exit of the column our product in a much much smaller buffer batch, which would impact uh, the footprint of the process. And if we decrease the footprint of the process, we will deeply decrease the cost of goods because the uh, cost of the process is mostly based on the footprint. And as you said, Jerry, when you decrease the size of your facility by 80% at Amgen, that's typically a way to decrease the cost of goods. And so changing one process step, thinking out of the box, not too much, but a little bit, is a way to decrease the cost of goods as well. So as I told you, this is my uh, advertising slide. We have three labs uh, in the world. 
world, one in France near Bordeaux, and one other in Burlington, Massachusetts, a 25 minutes drive from here, and one other in Shanghai, where we develop processes and we have GMP manufacturing capabilities in France and very soon in China as well. Um, but back to the trends. If we consider uncertainty and market growth, what's the key to that? Uh, for sure, flexibility is the key to uncertainty. If, if you can change your bioreactor, if you can add a bioreactor in your suite, if you can adapt your downstream skits to the tighter, to the quantity of product that you get at the, at, at the end of your process, upstream process, in this case, you can adapt yourself, yourself to uncertainty, thanks to this flexibility. And the answer is on the slide. Can you see a difference between stainless steel and single-use manufacturing? This is, of course, uh, this is, of course, Eliana for, uh, uh, for clinical manufacturing. <laughs> uh, but there is a huge difference, which is really the flexibility. You can put together, uh, you can uh, di different bags, you can use uh, your harvesting system in another suite, move it to this suite, harvest your bioreactor, change the, si uh, the size of your bioreactor. You, you can do a lot of things in a very short time. And that's one example of what you can do, thanks to single-use manufacturing. Uh, on the upper side, it's the stainless steel approach. You have to prepare your bioreactor. You have to condition your media. Then you can run your batch in the bioreactor. But afterwards, you, you, you have to clean in place your bioreactor. You have to prepare again, and it takes a lot of time. What do you have with single-use manufacturing? You take your bag, you put it on your skit, you run your batch. And then there is a contamination. Remove your batch, uh, your bag, uh, take another one, put it on your skid, and you can start again. And which means that you can run at the clinical scale, of course, you can run up to three times more batches uh, in the same facility. And that's what we've done uh, in our facility in France, and that's what we do for our customers. We not only claim that we can design single-use facilities for our customers, we've done it for ourselves, and our customers can benefit from our experience. Um, I had a movie, but it's, it, is, it has been removed. I'm sorry. Uh, so switching from stainless steel to single use is interesting, but ensuring that the quality of the product, that the process we, is, is still the same, and that you will get a potent product at the end of the process is key, of course. So it's a sort of tech transfer. So as you can see in this example, we, get, we got the same title when we switched from uh, stainless steel to single use, and the profile of the HPLC analysis is the same as well, as you can see in the center of the slide. One example with the glycans of interest, they are the same in a single-use bioreactor and in a stainless steel bioreactor. And that's very important to control that because the, ex the uh, extractables and leachables that are generated in a single-use bioreactor could impact uh, the glycosylation of the product, the aggregation of the product, or many other quality attributes. But we do that. Back to the trends, what if we consider cost pressure, uncertainty, and market growth, and consider that more and more people have to take transfer their process from one PD lab to many different facilities, many different regional facilities, one for Europe, one for Asia in Singapore, for example, one for North America, which is the case at Amgen for some of their products. So we consider that uh, tech transfer or process transfer is really the keystone of manufacturing from the beginning to the market access, from the PD lab to the pilot lab, to commercial manufacturing, to clinical manufacturing first, internal, external. So we have a specific program for that. And we work with a very structured approach for that. We, don't, we absolutely don't think out of the box for this tech transfer. We are very structured. And we consider all of this 6M based on this Ishigawa diagram. And I will take one example, which is uh, the equipment. When you want to take 
transfer your upstream process for one given bioreactor to another bioreactor from another provider or even from the same provider. When you want to do that, the mixing efficiency can vary from one to another. The, the shape of the bioreactor, the size of the spargers, the, the impeller type, all of those things, even from the same provider, can change. And at the end of the day, the size of the bubbles of oxygen in the bioreactor can change. And this will impact the way oxygen is going to be uh, to go from the bubble to the cell culture media, then from the cell culture media to the cell, and then to the mitochondria for respiration. And if you only consider mixing, uh, uh, mixing uh, average mixing of, of the bioreactor, uh, there is a risk not to uh, be uh, sustainable, um, not to be robust in the tech transfer. But if you decide to modelize the way the bioreactor uses uh, uh, the, the oxygen or generates bubbles, then you will get this very nice graph where you have the mass, uh, the volumetric mass transfer, which is, as you can see, impacted by the power per unit and by the gas velocity inside the bioreactor. And this is something that can be done for any or every bioreactor with any or every cell culture media. And when you do that in many different bioreactors, as you can see, you don't get the the same shape of the graph. And which means that if you want to get the same mass transfer, the same volumetric mass transfer, you will have to change the mixing, you will have to change the gas velocity in the bioreactor. And if you do that, you get a very robust tech transfer with something which is totally scalable from three liters to uh, 2,000 liters by reactor. And now we know that we can scale our processes from lab scale to manufacturing scale, from three liters to 2,000 liter scale, which is something that can be difficult. But thanks to this modeling approach, we got this result. And as you can see, even for the pH, which we know can, be, uh, can generate a lot of volatility, we get this result. The same for lactate. And of course, the cell viability and the cell density is the same at three liters and at 2,000 liters. So that's the way we approach that. And we will uh, propose a webinar at the end of this month. Uh, if you are interested in following up on this topic, please go on our website, amdmilliport.com slash webinars, where you can subscribe and you can further discuss on this, uh, on this aspect. Otherwise, if you have any questions, if we can support you, feel free to join us on our booth during the reception. There will be champagne, which is very nice. Uh, the booth is the number 313. I would be very happy to discuss with you. Thank you.